I'm a very unlikely Catholic. It's not, if you had told me I was going to become a Catholic, I would have laughed you. Um, so, uh, because it's Lent, it is Lent, isn't it? Wasn't yesterday Ash Wednesday? I didn't make it to Mass. <laughs> Jesus, forgive me. I was on airplanes and um, spreading my own sinner's gospel. I'll read this poem called Sinner's Welcome. Um, I think it's Nick Flynn has this kind of wonderful poem about a friend of his putting uh, little laminated mass cards all over his house. He says, um, he wants to save me, we disagree from what? <laughs> so I find Jesus in the cupboard, Jesus in the teapot, and the poem ends, my idea of hell is someone opening a shirt and saying, look what I did for you. <laughs> so this poem is called Sinner's Welcome, No Apostrophe. I opened up my shirt to show this man the flaming heart he lit in me. And I was scooped up like a lamb and carried to the dim warm. I who should have been kneeling was knelt to by one whose face should be emblazoned on every coin and diadem. No bare-chested boy, but Ulysses, with arms thick from the hard-hauled hard, hard ropes. He'd sailed past the clay gods and the singing girls who might have made of him a swine. That the world could arrive at me with him in it after so much longing, impossible. He enters me, and joy sprouts from us as from a split seed. Everybody thinks it's a poem about sex. I think it's a poem about communion. Descending Theology, The Garden. I always like the idea. Um, I did these um, Ignatian, the Ignatian prayer exercises, the Ignatian spiritual exercises. So there are a series of poems in here um, about that come from these kind of almost Tibetan meditations that you do. You're praying a, a couple of hours a day. It's this kind of visualization where you ask the Holy Spirit to place you in the gospel. You ask to be located with Christ at some portion of the gospel at different points over 30 weeks. And um, I always liked the garden because Jesus was throwing a tantrum, which is something I, I can understand. Descending theology, the garden. We know he was a man because once doomed, he begged for reprieve. See him grieve on his rock under olive trees, his companions asleep on the hard ground around him, wrapped in old hides. Not one stayed awake as he'd ask, which went through him like a sword. He wished with all his being to stay, but gave up bargaining at the sky. He knew it was all mercy, anyway, unearned as breath. The father couldn't intervene, though the gaze was never not wrapped, a mantle around him. This was our doing, our death. The dark prince had poured the vial of poison into the betrayer's ear, and it was done. Around the oasis where Jesus wept, the cracked earth radiated out for miles. In the green center, Jesus prayed for the pardon of Judas, who was approaching with soldiers. He glanced up, as Christ did, into the punctured sky until his neck bones ached. Here is his tear-riven face, come to press a kiss on his brother. <coughs> One of my favorite prayers is that, it's a Jesuit prayer, Jesus, my Lord, my Savior, and my good brother. Sprinkle me with the blood of the lamb. I love that, my good brother. Who knew? Me Catholic. I remember talking to Toby Wolf about it. I went to church with him once. He said, Mary, you know, when I met you when you were 21, this was one of the things I didn't really imagine I were doing. <laughs> Which was also a happy thing for me to hear. Um, there are these kind of bitter love poems in here. Orders from the invisible. Insert coin, mind the gap, do not disturb. Hung from the doorknob of a hotel room where a man begged to die entwined in my arms. 
He once wrote, he'd take the third rail in his teeth, which is how loving him turned out. <laughs> the airport's glass world glided me gone from him, and the sky I flew into grew a pearly cataract through which God lost sight of us. The moving walk is nearing its end. The diner jukebox told me, choose again. And the waitress hollers over, all them soul songs got broke. She speaks from the cook's window, steam smearing her face of all feature. The tongue is a form of fire, the Bible says. And in the computer's unstarred blue, the man's brutal missives drag me along by my throat. Press yes to a race. Coat hanger bent into halo. Gathering up my mother's clothes for the poor, I find the coat hanger that almost aborted me, or so I dub it. It's the last hand clung to the high rod. Unwound, it could have poked through the pink puckered hole of her cervix to spill me before I got going good. Instead, from the furred little litter of souls squirming to become visible, I was picked. May I someday spy mother's poppy-studded hat on the skull of a street corner gospel singer, swarming with sores. May I twist from this black wire a halo to crown my son's head. It's probably cheating to read a resurrection poem in the middle of Lent, isn't it? Descending theology, the resurrection. From the far star points of his pinned extremities, cold inched in, black ice and blood ink, till the hung flesh was empty. Lonely in that void, even for pain, he missed his splintered feet, the human stare buried in his face. He ached for two hands made of meat he could reach to the end of. In the corpse's core, the stone fist of his heart began to bang on the stiff chest door, and breath spilled back into that battered shape. Now it's your limbs he longs to flow into, from the sunflower center in your chest outward, as warm water shatters at birth, rivering every way. I, um, I was prepared to become Catholic by a mother who gave me Sartre to read when I was 12. I remember asking her about that. Why would you want me to read nausea? And this poem is about that. It's called Pathetic Fallacy. When it became impossible to speak to you due, due to your having died and been incinerated, I sometimes held the uncradled phone with its neat digits and arcane symbols, crosshatch, black star, as if embedded in it were some code I could punch in to reach you. You bequeathed me this morbid bent, mother. Who gives her sixth grade daughter Sartre's nausea to read? All my life, I watched you face the void, leaning into it as a child with a black balloon will bury her countenance, either to hide from or to merge with that darkness. Small wonder that still, in the invisible scrim of air that delineates our separate worlds. Your features sometimes press toward me, all silvery from the afterlife, woven into wind to whisper a caution, or your hand on my back shoves me into my life. Um, in kindergarten, they had these placards to teach us um, how to, um, you know, what the, let the noises the letters made. And I remember the K, they drew a, a line across the K, you know, the little K to make a desk out of it, desk. And I remember thinking that was such a lame icon for me to have. It was just, I hated it. I wanted something with some force and fire, and I got the, that desk. Revelations in the key of K. <coughs> I came awake in kindergarten 
under the letter K, chalked neat on a field green placard, leaned on the blackboard's top edge. They caged me in a metal desk, the dull word writ to show K's sound. But K meant kick and kill when a boy I'd kissed drew me as a whiskered troll in art. <laughs> On my sheet, the puffy clouds I made to keep rain in, let torrents loose. Screw those who color in the lines my mom had preached. Words I shared that landed me on a short chair. <laughs> Facing the corner's empty sheetrock page. Craning up, I found my K high above. You'll have to grow to hear, its silence said. And in the surrounding alphabet, my whole life hid. Names of my beloveds sacred vows I'd break. With my pencil stub applied to wall, I moved around the loops and vectors, Z to A, learning how to mean, how in the mean world to be. But while I worked, the room around me began to smudge like a charcoal sketch my mom was rubbing with her thumb. Then the instant went, the month, and every season smeared till with a wrenching arm tug, I was here, grown, but still bent to set down words before the black eraser swipes our moment into cloud, dispersing all to zip. And when I blunder in the valley of the shadow of blank about to break in half, my being leans against my spinal K, which props me up, broomstick straight, a strong bone in the crypt of flesh I am. <laughs> Oratorio for the Unbecoming. A lot of poems about birth in here. Not so much giving it as having had it. I used to worry all the time, and the reason I became Christian, it was so accidental, I really didn't mean to. It's like I tripped and I was Catholic. <laughs> <coughs> My son came to me one morning and said, I want to go to church. And I said, why? <laughs> when we could stay here and eat bagels and read the New York Times. And he said, um, to see if God's there. Which is like, you know, I, what a smart reason. It never occurred to me. <laughs> he was so, he was six. He was too dumb to know how much he knew. And um, so then we went to all these zendos and temples and mosques and, you know, midrashes and hippie, uh, meditation centers, and we wound up Catholic. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> Oratorio for the Unbecoming. Born, I eventually grew hind legs to rear back on and learned that I was other than the miasma that mothered me, and so I begged to re-enter her body. Told no, I staggered forth to whap my head on table corners. My tongue was a small stub jabbering want. In the morning funnies, little orphan Annie had an eye like a white pin dot. And when I watched her blankly watching me, the complex universe crawled into my head. Mirrors spooked me too. The kid inside eluded me, though her fingertips fit perfectly to mine. The mystery of who she was floated on a silver surface uncertain as mercury. The heart is a mirror also, and in my chest I felt this tight bud of petals held a face, God with his stare of a zillion suns. He told me the risen Lord was a sack of meat and a brother to me, that the Holy Ghost was the girl pronoun in all the sacred text who longed to steer my body's ship. He swears now this form is carved by him. Have mercy the soul singer says, and I say, blessed be the air I breathe these words with, for it makes a body wonder. Delinquent missive. David Ricardo. David Ricardo taught me the value of vernacular when I was trying to tutor him in geometry. He was about 20 years old and couldn't get out of the ninth grade in my hometown and uh, wound up stabbing his father, not to death, although he stabbed him 16 times with a fork, which is how the poem begins. Delinquent missive.
Before David Ricardo stabbed his daddy 16 times with a fork, once for every year of my quad life, he'd long showed signs of being bent. In school, he got no valentine nor birthday cake embellished with his name. On Halloween, a towel tied around his neck was all he had to be a hero with. He spat in the punch bowl and smelled like a foot. His forehead was a ledge he leered beneath. When I was sent to tutor him in geometry so he might leave at last ninth grade, he sat running pencil lead beneath his nails. If radiance shone from his mud hole, mud hole eyes, I missed it. Thanks, David, for your fine slang. You called my postulates post holes. Your mom was suffering ferocious of the liver. Plus, you ignored, when I saw you at lunch, my flinch. Maybe by now you're ectoplasm, or you're the zillionth winner of the Texas death penalty sweepstakes, or you occupy a locked room with a small round window held fast by rivets through which you are watched. I hope some organism drew your care, an orchid, a cockroach even, some inmate whose meat you had to cut since he lacked hands. Only in this way could the unbudgeable stone that plugged the tomb hole in your chest roll back, and in your sad slit eyes could blaze that star adored by its maker. The only journal I have from when I was a little kid, I, from 1965, I was 10 years old, and I wrote in, um, you know, kind of bad cursive. Is this, are y'all hearing me now in this? When I grow up, I will write half poetry and half autobiography. Isn't that weird to even think of such a thing? My sister was in New York this week with me, and we were trying to remember what autobiographies we even had ever read in 1965, I think I'd read Helen Keller was about it. Maybe Madame Curie? I don't know. Um, but this is a poem, um, I think about the choice to be a poet, which I think was never a choice for me at all. I could, when I was five, if you'd asked me what I wanted to be, I would have been said a poet. That's a really sad ambition, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it? It's so pathetic. It really is. I mean, who thinks up such a thing? The choice. Once in northern England, I got a few pub drunks to drive to Wordsworth's house. Local thugs whose underheated VW, orange, took me fishtailing down icy hills through hedgerows in an unlit labyrinth, reminiscent of the library stacks I wandered around zombie-like each day, not composing verses, but waiting in scarlet lipstick for the bars to open. I'd left my homeland, fleeing a man I'd faked first caring, then not caring about. And in months of Euclidean solitude, I'd written no cogent phrase. The notebook in my knapsack was a talisman I carried so as not to look like a bimbo. But bimbo I was. And open, the bound pages were only white wings to nap on. Near dawn, our caravan came to a sleek glazed window, a child's stumpy desk with the poet's initials penknifed on top. It was my first stab of reverence. When that hunger to emblazon some surface with oneself became barbarous wonder at someone else. W.W. -W, jagged as inverted Alps, unscalable as a cathedral's gold leaf dome. After that, grad school was a must. There, I posed as supplicant till enough magnificence had been poured down my throat that I could whiff the difference between it and the stench I spilled. When I told the resident genius that given a choice between writing and being happy, this, by the way, is Louise Gluck, who was my thesis advisor. When I told the resident genius that given the choice between writing and being happy, I'd pick the latter. She touched my folio with her pencil, like a bad fairy's wand, saying, don't worry, you don't have that choice. <laughs> In 
And in a blink of my unmascarid eye, the intricate world bloomed into being, impossible to transcribe on that small bare page. I really like the curse of the cat people. <laughs> Who the meek are not. Who the meek are not. I had this great Franciscan nun for a spiritual director for a while. She was always correcting Greek uh, translations. Who the meek are not. Not the bristle-bearded Igors bent under burlap sacks. Not peasants knee-deep knee in the rice paddy muck. Not the serfs whose quarter-moon sickles make the wheat fall in waves that they don't get to eat. My friend, the Franciscan nun, says we misread that word meek in the Bible verse that blesses them. To understand the meek, she says, picture a great stallion at full gallop in a meadow who, at his master's voice, seizes up to a stunned but instant halt. So with the strain of holding that great power in check, the muscles along the arched neck eddying and only the velvet ears pricked forward awaiting the next order. She was also the one I was arguing with her about the resurrection. I was saying, you know, this is clearly horse <coughs> You expect me to believe this? She said, it's easier for you to believe the meek are going to inherit the earth. It's, like, it's good, isn't it? That's smart theology, I think. Consider me put in my place. Hurt Hospital's best suicide jokes. I don't drink anymore, and one thing that I like about talking to people who used to drink is all the suicide uh, failures you get to hear about. I talk to a lot of drug, drug addicts and drunks, and I work in a soup kitchen in New York. You just get to hear these amazing, you know, how I didn't kill myself stories. They're really, and they're really astonishing, the number of things you can do to yourself and not die. And this entails a couple of them. And unfolded aluminum chairs the color of and set in a circle as if to corral some emptiness in this church basement deep in the dirt. Strangers sit and tell stories. Case sipped wine in a hot tub. Janice threw back shots in a dive. Bob drew blinds to smoke blunts and ate nothing but cake frosting bought by the case. The first lady of some place swiped her son's meds to stay slim. Craig burst through the bank doors, machine gun in hand. John geezed heroin with a turkey baster, he says, into a neck vein. A cop shoved Mark's face in the mud, put a shoe on his back to cuff him and said, and asked where his friends were. I had friends, he said. You think I'd do this? Zola once wrote that the road from the shrine at Lourdes was impressively littered with crutches and canes, but he noted not one wooden leg. In the garage with your face through a noose, you kick out the ladder, but the green rope won't give. And when your wife clicks the garage switch and the door tilts up, there you dangle on tiptoe. Alive, all of us, on this island where we sip only black liquids or clear water and face down the void we've shaped. And should our eyes meet, what howls erupt like jackals? We bawl to find ourselves upright. Last love. For years, I chose the man to suit the instant, from good guy to goat boy, dreadlocked to crew cut. Not one could bridle me. In place of lace veil, I peered from bandage gauze, and if, in rage, some suitor tore that off, the red sun was a scald, and I felt scalped and rocket shot onto the nearest flight. So everyone I kissed left hurt. One man broke the table I served him bread on. Another claimed my heart was arsenic at its core. When my last love came, he slid a palm across mine eyes, lent me his mouth, a bitten plum, lay his head in the middle of me, bent me to that. Nights now, 
My face rests on the meadow of his chest, so I am a loose-petaled poppy blown open, a girl again for the first time hearing the earth's heartbeat. A blessing from my 16 year son. I have this son who assembled inside me during Hurricane Gloria. In a flash, he appeared in a tiny blaze. Outside pines toppled, phone lines snapped and hissed like cobras. Inside, he was a raw pearl, microscopic, luminous. Look at the muscled obelisk of him now, pawing through the icebox for more grapes. <laughs> 16 years and not a bone broken, not a single stitch. By his age, I was marked more ways and small. He's a slouching six foot three with implausible blue eyes which settle on the pages of Emerson's self-reliance with profound belligerence. A girl with a navel ring could make his cell phone go buzz or an afroed boy leaning on a mop at Taco Bell, creatures strange as dragons or eels. Balanced on a kitchen stool, each one gives counsel arcane as any oracle. Rodney claims school is harshing my mellow. <laughs> Love that phrase. <laughs> Case longs to date a tattooed girl because he wants a woman Willing to do stuff she'll regret. <laughs> They've come to lead my son into his broadening spiral. Someday soon, the tether will snap. I birthed my own mom into oblivion. The night my son smashed the car fender, then rode home in a rain-streaked cop car, he asked, did you and dad screw up this much? He'd let me tuck him in. My grandmother's wedding quilt from 1912 drawn to his goateed chin. Don't blame us, I said. You're your own idiot now, at which he grinned. The cop said the girl in the crimped Chevy took it hard. He found my son awkwardly holding her in the canted headlights, where he draped his own coat over her shaking shoulders. My fault, he'd confessed right off. Nice kid, said the cop. Thank you. Thank you.